You're watching Tag TV. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button. Hello, you are I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. New Delhi and Moscow have committed to further strengthen their military ties despite Washington's looming sanctions on Delhi under Katsa for purchasing S-400 missile system. In Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov's visit to New Delhi, this week the two sides said that talks were underway to make more military equipment together. This comes after Russian arms export that has been a key to Indian defence witnessed a drop in last couple of years with New Delhi exploring other markets including the US for major defence acquisitions. Rapidly evolving diplomatic equations and the formation of new alliances globally will not have any impact on the Indo-Russia bilateral relationship. The foreign minister's meeting this week clearly indicated. Quashing all assumptions of ties between the two at crossroads following India's growing proximity with Washington in the past few years. In fact, the two sides said that they are exploring the scope of boosting the joint military production under Prime Minister Narendra Modi's ambition of Atmanirbhar Bharat or self-dependent India. Russia, which has remained the biggest defence exporter to New Delhi over the years, said its commitment towards Indian partnership is unfazed by Washington's entry into Indian defence needs and the threats of sanctions it brings along. имеет контракты с Россией или планирует подписать контракты с Россией на поставку вооружений, это публично заявлено Соединенными Штатами без всяких стеснений, все это хорошо знают. Но также хорошо мы знаем и ответную реакцию со стороны Индии. Мы сегодня эти американские заходы не обсуждали, мы подтвердили нашу нацеленность на развитие военно-технического сотрудничества. У нас действуют межправительственные комиссии по ВТС, у нее есть свои планы, в том числе и обсуждаются перспективы дополнительного производства российской военной техники на территории Индии в рамках концепции «Делай в Индии» и в рамках концепции «Самостоятельной Индии». Так что здесь я не почувствовал каких-либо колебаний со стороны наших индийских друзей и партнеров. The United States has expressed deep reservations over New Delhi's $5.4 billion deal with Russia to purchase five S-400 missile systems. India has already made the first tranche of payment of $800 million despite the U.S. warning of sanctions. New Delhi, however, has clearly stated in the past that it has no intentions of straining ties with the U.S. and expects a waiver on the grounds of enhancing its defence system against the potential threats from a belligerent China. Russia has played a key role in building the Indian defence system and continues to be a major defence partner. And the ties have graduated from a buyer-seller relationship to joint development of T-90 tanks and Su-30 MKI aircraft, supply of MiG-29K aircraft and Camo-31 and Mi-17 helicopters. Both have together upgraded MiG-29 aircraft and developed supersonic BrahMos missile. Not just defence, the two sides are also working at enhancing economic cooperation and improving connectivity. We are both cognizant of the multipolar and rebalanced nature of international relations today. We both understand the importance of our relationship to global peace, security and stability. Our bilateral cooperation remains energetic and forward-looking. We talked about long-standing partnership in nuclear space and defense sectors. We assess positively our economic cooperation, 
noting the new opportunities in Russian Far East. We spoke of connectivity, including the International North-South Transport Corridor and the chennai Vladivostok Eastern Maritime Corridor. While a growing bitterness between Kremlin and the White House is being seen as a potential deal spoiler for India, many observers around the world see it as an opportunity for New Delhi. India, which has maintained its preference for individual relationships, is needed by both heavyweights. Experts believe while the US needs New Delhi's sustained support in achieving its objectives of countering Chinese influence in Indo-Pacific, Russia's declining arms export is in desperate need of Indian save. India, on another side, believes in peaceful relations with both to meet its economic, defense and strategic needs. Moving on. COVID-19 has resurged massively in South Asia and the governments are scrambling to repeat the comprehensive curbs they imposed in wake of its outbreak last year. And while the largest country in the region, India, is doubly prepared, others are struggling to contain it. Pakistan, which has remained in denial mode since the beginning, is running pillar to post seeking vaccine support. Bangladesh, on the other side, has logged entire country once again. The positive news amid the crisis has been a lower mortality rate and an encouraging recovery rate. Amid an unprecedented surge in the COVID cases, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi chaired a top-level virtual meeting with chief ministers of different Indian states. He urged everybody in the decision-making bodies to prioritize the distribution of vaccines amid a growing demand of expanding the vaccination drive for all citizens. India has vaccinated around 100 million people and says it has 43 million doses in the stock or in pipeline for coming days. However, a steep rise in the number of infections has caught everybody by surprise and experts believe that the government is required to take major steps to contain it. कोरोना के प्रसार को रोकने के लिए फिर से युद्ध स्तर पर काम करना आवश्यक है साथियों इन तमाम चुनौतियों के बावजूद हमारे पास पहले की अपेक्षा बेहतर अनुभव है पहले से एक अपेक्षा अच्छे संसाधन है और अब एक वैक्सीन भी हमारे पास है Meanwhile, the health teams on ground are racing against time to vaccinate everybody in the age brackets. The administration has laid special emphasis on the far-flung areas where the infection rate is not intense but complacency could prove disastrous. With around 13 million cases, India is the third worst affected country trailing the United States and Brazil. The only reprieve amidst the crisis has been a low mortality rate and a fast recovery rate. New Delhi says its aim has been to protect those who are vulnerable and will continue to vaccinate them on priority across the country. मेरे भट्टे में जो मजदूर लोग हैं राजस्थान के उनको 45 साल के ऊपर के उम्र वाले को वैक्सीन दिया गया है और काविठा आरोग्य केंद्र वाला है जो टीम आई थी उन्हें अच्छे तरीके से अच्छे ढंग से सेवा दी है। Meanwhile in Pakistan, thousands of Pakistanis rushed to get inoculated in the first round of commercial sales of COVID-19 vaccines. Most of the sites declared sold out in just hours of the commencement of the exercise. Pakistan is currently offering free vaccines to frontline healthcare workers and people over the age of 50, but the drive has thus far been slow and last month the country allowed commercial imports by the private sector for the general public. Very happy, very happy and thankful because um, you travel maybe vaccination requirement or and generally normal life return. So very happy to get it. 
Another South Asian country, Bangladesh, that has also started its vaccination drive through India-made AstraZeneca vaccine, imposed a week-long lockdown after the infection rate spiked suddenly in past few weeks. A group of shop owners and workers protested the lockdown on the streets of the capital, demanding the government to allow them to remain open during business hours if they maintain social distancing and mask guidelines. Bangladesh's economy has been severely hit by the pandemic, but a weak health system has kept the government cautious while reopening the economy entirely. Moving on. If the COVID-19 pandemic challenged the health system of the world and tested its crisis readiness, it also unmasked the opportunists and villains masquerading as champions of humanity. While benevolence of countries like India has been one exemplary story, China on the other side has emerged as a brutal opportunist who is imposing its vaccines on people. Nepali students are scared of missing out on education and employment. Hence, they have obliged and are taking Chinese vaccines. These people standing in queue to receive Chinese COVID vaccine have no idea about its efficacy, immunogenicity or the coercive diplomacy being played around it by Beijing. The safety concerns persist and enough data is not available. Despite that, they are being inoculated. Nepal has received 800,000 Verocell vaccine doses from China after its first phase carried out a million inoculations with India donated vaccine. This time, however, the story is not the same. Disregarding the process, Nepali authorities have asked students studying in China to get themselves administered with it first, as China won't give them entry unless they have taken Chinese vaccine and mandatorily the Chinese vaccine. Students are scared, but they don't seem to have any option. To be completely honest, I'm quite a bit nervous about it because, you know, we don't have really good feedbacks about it yet. So, yeah, finger crossed. And while China has been coercing people into taking vaccines it has produced, its own people at home are raising doubts over its efficacy. Reportedly, people in Wuhan have expressed serious reservations against vaccine inoculation. Chinese vaccines that have already been rejected by a few countries are yet to receive a WHO nod. A Brazilian trial into one of the Chinese vaccines had shown its efficacy a little over just 50%. And while the world clearly seems to reject it, the Communist Party of China is imposing it on the vulnerable, poor or those under its debt trap. It has also targeted countries whose vaccine programs are dependent entirely on others. The Nepali students too have found themselves at the receiving end of the Saturday campaign. No Chinese vaccine means an immediate and an indefinite barrier in their education. Career prospects will receive a major blow. Observers say Beijing has calculated it all. I just want to go back to China and as I've heard that like the students that take the Chinese vaccine, they are only able to go back, so I just want to take the vaccine. China has not been walking the talk when it comes to fostering international collaboration to fight the pandemic. While its mouthpieces have been reiterating the script, suggesting China's intent to help all, the actions on the ground have reflected a contrary position. It has not only imposed its vaccines on smaller nations using its hard power, the exclusionary steps it is resorting to has made things even clearer. A red supply chain, they say, is what China ambitions for, and the initial setbacks owing to more trust being shown in American or India-made vaccines has made it desperate and even more despotic. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from the Asian continent that hit the headlines this week. Iran and the United States have begun indirect talks in Vienna in a bid to bring both countries back into full compliance with the 2015 nuclear deal. The deal that was signed in 2015 under President Obama had been abandoned in 2018 by his successor Donald Trump. 
در حال حاضر به نتایج این نشست خوشبین یا بدبین نیستیم اما اطمینان داریم که در مسیر درستی قدم گذاشته ایم و در صورتی که اراده جدیت و صداقت آمریکا به اثبات برسد می تواند نشانه خوبی برای آینده بهتر آینده برای صلح امنیت در منطقه و جهان و زندگی با آرامش مردم در این منطقه خواهد بود قطعا این توافق در نهایت و اجرای کامل آن در هفته های آتی پیش رو خواهد بود Meanwhile, Iranian authorities have revealed that they have produced 55 kilograms of highly enriched uranium, a rate even faster than goal set by Iranian parliament. As per the law created in January, the country had resolved to produce 10 kilograms of uranium enriched per month. Iran has made uranium enriched to up to 20%, the point at which it is highly enriched. Israel's new parliament was sworn in amid an unprecedented political stalemate after an inconclusive election. The ceremony took place hours after a skeptical president, Reuven Rivlin, invited Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to form a new government. The country's longest serving leader, in power consecutively since 2009, now faces the tough challenge of enlisting enough allies for a governing coalition. Under law, Netanyahu will have 28 days to do so, with the possibility of a two-week extension before President Reuven Rivlin picks another candidate or asks Parliament to choose one. Continued deadlock could ultimately result in a new election. The construction industry of Japan is bringing to use the latest technology that uses high-quality material for power transmission in the building. Furukawa Electric has developed a high-performance low-voltage aluminium conductor CV cable, which is also known as Raku Raku cable. Earlier copper cables were used in the buildings, but now aluminium cables are preferred as they are soft and light in weight. Moreover, they require less manpower and are convenient to fix. セコメンでは作業員さんの肉体的負担が軽減でき、作業性が高まることで労働災害を未然に防ぐことにつながります。運搬者から荷降ろしされた後の校内でのドラム運搬は人力によるものですが、ドラムの方向転換からセット、沿
快適性が感じられると。As Japan practices high safety standards against disasters like earthquake and fire, therefore, the latest material by Shimizu Corporation is used. Shimizu Corporation had demonstrated high quality housing around the world. It had also designed and built apartments in Indonesia. Its concrete and wood structure impersonates traditional Japanese culture and is earthquake and fire resistant. In our cultural section today, we take you to the southern Indian city of Hyderabad, where a 10 day long Afghan food and cultural festival is being organized. Exhibitors and chefs from Afghanistan showcase their country's traditional food items and handicrafts. Take a look at this move to strengthen ties between India and Afghanistan. India is a home to a large number of Afghans who have migrated here due to ongoing conflict back home. Settled in metropolitan cities across India, the Afghans find themselves safe as they easily mingle with the Indian society and its culture. In a move to promote Afghan culture and its food in India, a 10-day long Afghanistan food festival is being organized in India's southern city of Hyderabad. Chefs from Afghanistan cooked and showcased delicious Afghani dishes along with a variety of dry fruits and a number of ornaments stuffed with precious stones. I came here for food festival to do city folk dish. I serve uh, different uh, Afghan foods here. And the uh, case which they added Afghan foods, they, are, they found something different. Like example, they are found in some less spicy or less masala, which is exactly is not too much masala like Indian food. Afghan kofta, korma, Afghan kaddu burani, Afghani burger, kebabs and variety of naans were put on display. The locals enjoy eating lip-smacking Afghani dishes. The idea of this particular festival is to connect, create a bridge between Afghanistan and Telangana. And uh, the experience that I have is the easiest way to communicate with people is through food. The festival not only enhanced the cultural ties between India and Afghanistan, but improved people-to-people -people contacts. The main purpose of these uh, festivals, events or to further also expand the trade and business between the two countries. Uh, we already have vendors uh, who have come from Afghanistan and they have um, their products on display here. Uh, we have dry fruits being displayed here, carpets displayed, and jewelry and the lapis lazuli poetry, handicrafts, all of uh, these uh, products from Afghanistan. Exhibitors from Afghanistan also set up their stalls at the festival, enabling visitors to buy exquisite pieces of handicraft and handloom products like carpets and jewellery. The exhibitors from Afghanistan firmly believe that the festival has opened gates for them to a large Indian market. Such types of exhibitions and events help people get to know about each other's culture and food habits. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.